Today's scripture is coming from um, the book of uh, Psalm, chapter 62, from verses 5 to 12. Reading from the International Version. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I would not be shaken. My salvation and honor depends on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighed on the balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love and you reward everyone according to what they have done. This end the scripture reading. Does God want me to be poor? Does God want me to be poor? I think that's a question that challenges us today. Now, if you have a uh, Bible or a Bible app on your phone or on your computer, uh, you want to pull that up. We're going to be reading this morning from Matthew 19, verses 21 to 26. Matthew 19, 21 to 26. Now, the passage we're about to read today is one I think troubles us as Christians because it seems to say that you can't get into heaven if you're rich. And if that's the case, then how poor do we have to be? Do we have to live in squalor? Can I afford a nice home? You know, if the church owns a house, am I absolved of all blame? This guy comes up to Jesus one day and asks him what he needs to do to obtain eternal life. And Jesus tells him, obey the commandments. And the man replies, well, I've done all that. What do I still lack? And we hear Jesus' answer in our reading this morning. So we're going to read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 21 through 26. So hear now the word of God. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And the young man heard this. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I tell you, it is hard for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they are greatly astonished and asked, well, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Word of God for the people of God. And the people said, thanks be to God. Now, it sounds like the rich young man got the short end of the stick. I mean, by all... By all accounts, he seemed to be a pretty good guy. And it sounds like Jesus was just, you know, a little bit tough on him. As far as we knew, he, he loved his neighbor. He wasn't adulterous. Uh, he didn't lie, cheat, or steal. He honored his parents. But still, he wonders, what can I do to, to gain eternal life? And there's just something in him that, that feels like he's not quite there. The hole in his gut that he doesn't know how to fill. So he asks Jesus this question, he goes up to him and 
He says, you know, what do I still lack? I've, I've done all these things, but what do I still lack? And Jesus responds with what we read in the passage today. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Sounds like Jesus is telling him that to get to heaven, he needs to get rid of all his stuff, right? But Jesus' answer wasn't, you lack faith that only comes from poverty. He says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Which begs the question, can any of us be perfect? The answer, of course, is no. So why does Jesus answer this way? Jesus is forcing this guy and us to go deeper. He wants us to consider that it's more than just a set of rules that gets us into heaven. He wants us, this rich young man to reflect on how his wealth is getting in the way of his relationship with God. It's why Jesus tells his disciples it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples don't know all this, and they're shocked, like a lot of us would be shocked, hearing Jesus' answer. You know, if, if this guy can't get in, who's, who's doing all these great things, then who can? And Jesus responds, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That gap between where we are and where we need to be is made possible by relying on God. All that stuff that gets in the way of going deeper with God, of, of learning to rely on God for the peace that we seek hard for us to realize how much we need God when we have so much. I know there are times when you think, I really don't have that much. But you have more than you think. And a lot of times, it's tough for us to let go of material things of this world to embrace the more spiritual things of the next more a person has, the harder it is to see how deeply we need God. We start to re rely on ourselves because we think, well, I've got enough money, I can pay for my medicine. I've got enough money, I can pay for my food. I've got enough money, I can pay for my house. So you think it's all about you. But there's still that hole that can't be filled by whatever money or possessions that you have. What do I need to gain eternal life? You know, the thing is, he didn't ask, what can I do to please God? Or how can I serve God better? He's asking what he could do to earn salvation. What can I do to get into heaven? And that's why Jesus responds the way he does. Do you want to be perfect? He starts out because only the perfect person can get into heaven on his own merit. And none of us are perfect. The key is to put ourselves in God's hands. Now, John Wesley, the father of Methodism, came up with a three-step approach to wealth management. He came up with a three-step approach to wealth management. He summed it up this way, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. For John, there was nothing wrong with earning money as long as you did it in a way that honored God, that you didn't cheat or steal. They proposed that you, you save all that you could. Now, he wasn't advocating that you stuff your bank account. He meant that we shouldn't squander away 
the blessings that we have. We shouldn't spend it frivolously, but that we should be good stewards of God's blessing. And finally, we should give all we can. It was this third part that was the key to the other two. And there was nothing wrong with being wealthy. There was nothing wrong with being... But there was something wrong with being frivolous or stingy or greedy. That we're supposed to use what we have in service of others. No matter how much or, or how little, we do what we can. I think that Warren Buffett might have been a fan of John Wesley, uh, or vice versa, <laughs> because Warren Buffett, along with Bill and Melinda Gates, began an exclusive club for billionaires, and they called it the Giving Pledge. And as reported on 60 Minutes, there are only two requirements to join. One, that you have a net worth of over a billion dollars, and two, that you pledge to give at least half of it away in the course of your lifetime. So you have to have a net worth of a billion dollars and pledge to give at least half of it away. Bill and Melinda Gates have, have pledged to give away 95% of their vast fortune. Warren Buffett planned to give away 99% of his. And when asked what he thought about leaving the fortune to their kids, he said, I don't really think that as a society, we want to confer blessings on generation after generation who contribute nothing to society simply because somebody in the far distant past happened to accumulate a great sum of wealth. Giving away vast sums of money when you have vast sums of money seems to be a no brainer. I mean, who couldn't live off that much wealth? But Buffett explains that not everyone's on board. <laughs> In the interview on 60 Minutes, he said, uh, I've gotten a lot of yeses when I've called people, but I've gotten a lot of no's too. And I'm tempted because I've been calling people with a billion dollars or more. I've been tempted to think that if they can't sign up for 50%, maybe I should write a book on how to get by on 500 million. Because apparently there's a lot of people that don't know how to do it. Jesus wasn't kidding when he said that wealth gets in the way of our relationship with God. There are billionaires who are worried they don't have enough. Money causes us to do some irrational things. We're tempted to hold on to it. We're fearful of letting it go. We worry what might happen if we don't have it or don't have enough of it. And so it dominates our lives the way that we really should let God dominate our lives. Jesus even warned us about the effects money can have in our relationship with God. He said in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then in what is perhaps the most famous for some money, Paul wrote to Timothy, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So it's not that God wants us to be poor. It's our love of money, our, our desire to be self-reliant to the point of not needing God is what separates us from God. And it doesn't have to be money. It could be anything that we have an abundance of. Fame, power, Pokemon cards. I don't know. It doesn't matter. When we live in abundance, we become arrogant, self-righteous, and proud. And that leads us to less reliance on God. To avoid this temptation, uh, I think we should follow Uncle Ben's advice. Not the instant rice guy, but Spider-Man's 
uncle, Uncle Ben from the comic books. And what Uncle Ben said was, with great power comes great responsibility. With great power comes great responsibility. Ben's advice is similar to the words of John Wesley, who modeled his words after Jesus, who said in Luke 12, 48, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. From the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. The concept is simple. Those who have an abundance owe it to those who do not to be good stewards of it. To share, to give, to use it responsibly. That's how we keep from letting our abundance get in the way of God. By remembering that it belongs to him and we are simply caretakers of it. Poor and rich are relative terms. We can be exceptionally wealthy and poor in spirit or vice versa. Having one does not mean having the other. In fact, sometimes you have to work at it. Only a fool believes in the, in the only a fool believes he is poor in the face of the abundance of God's blessing or rich in the absence of God's presence in his life. Only a fool believes he is poor in the face of the abundance of God's blessing or rich in the absence of God's presence in his life. What we need to remember is that only one of those things lasts forever. The other one is gone the moment we die. The truth is, God wants everyone to be rich. But rich in what matters most, our relationship with him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, as we close worship today, um, wanted to share one final song with everyone. And so for that, of course, I can turn things back over to Naomi. Naomi. Yes. Thank you, Reverend Craig. Thank you for that wonderful message. It's always just so important to remember those things and to know that God does bless us. And that's why we are all able to be here together to share with one another and to share with the world around us. And so our final song is actually led by CJ, Pass It On. Oh. 
Very nice, CJ. Thank you for that. Thank you, Naomi. Um, and thank you to all of you for being here with us today. Remember, starting next week, we will be here for in-person worship. But if you can't make it or you prefer to stay at home um, or you can't make it because you're too far away, for whatever reason, if you want to join us online, please do so. We will be having uh, what they call hybrid worship, which means whether you're here or you're online, you'll still be able to experience worship together with us. And we just want you along for the ride. So thank you so much for sharing your faith journey with us and allowing us to be part of it. So until we can meet again, may the Lord God keep you and bless you. May he give you a heart for giving, not out of duty or compulsion, but out of love and grace and mercy. And we give all these things to Jesus Christ. Amen.